This week on The Word of the Lord Endures Forever, we finish Zephaniah with Israel's joy and restoration and then move to 1 Timothy with introduction, using the law lawfully, Christ comes to save sinners, and shipwreck of faith. Join me, Pastor Will Whedon, for The Word of the Lord Endures Forever, your daily 15-minute verse-by-verse Bible study on demand. Listen at thewordendures.org or your favorite podcast provider. I would say most Roman Catholic apologists have a healthy respect for the 16th century Martin Luther. There are a few, however, that have what you could call Luther derangement syndrome. They just can't stop saying bad things about Luther, thinking that, well, he must be the source of Lutheran theology. He isn't. And if they can take him down, then they can take down the truths of Lutheran theology. Welcome back to Issues Etc. Joining us on this Wednesday afternoon to respond to some criticisms of Martin Luther made by Roman Catholic apologist Dr. Taylor Marshall. Dr. Stephen Parks, he's senior pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in Glendora, California, formerly served as an associate professor of theology and philosophy at Concordia University, Irvine, California. Dr. Parks, welcome back. Thank you, Todd. It's so great to be back with you today. Are any of the assertions that we're going to hear from Dr. Taylor Marshall today new? No, they're not. I think just about every potential thing that could have been said about Luther negatively, (laughs) all of the slanders one could possibly come up with were pretty much uh, said more or less within his lifetime. And certainly if they they didn't happen within his lifetime, they happened soon thereafter. So you've had uh, friends and foes of Luther alike speaking about and writing about him for the last 500 years. So just about everything that possibly could be said about the man has been said. Now, when it comes to the criticism that Taylor Marshall tends to to levy against Luther, these aren't anything new. These are the kinds of things that Catholic apologists and theologians have been saying against Luther and against his theology for half a millennia. So they're old arguments, but unfortunately, what tends to happen sometimes in these discussions and dialogues is... Sometimes we just don't listen to one another. And so we just kind of repeat the same tired old talking points without ever actually investigating them ourselves. And I think, unfortunately, that's what Taylor Marshall does. Who is Taylor Marshall? So Taylor Marshall considers himself to be a Catholic apologist. He is a a former Episcopal priest who converted to Catholicism. He's very much an advocate of kind of what we might call the traditionalist strain within Roman Catholicism. So he's very much a an Orthodox Roman Catholic, so to speak. And so he advocates that on things like his YouTube channel. He's a writer. He's written somewhere in the neighborhood of about a dozen books. And he actually writes both fiction and nonfiction in an effort to promote a traditional form of Catholicism. He's a very outspoken critic of uh, Pope Francis, the current Bishop of Rome. Let's hear the first of his assertions about Martin Luther regarding Luther's addition to the word alone in Romans 3.28. How do Catholics view Martin Luther? Nobody asked that question on Twitter, but I saw people bring up Martin Luther. So he's a heresy arc, which is like an arch heretic. Like he's a real bad heretic. The bad thing about Luther is, is he believed in justification by faith alone. And when he translated Romans chapter three into German, he actually wrote justif- justified by faith alone. But in the Greek, there is no alone. He added that word in the Romans chapter three. So all these German people read the Bible like, oh yeah, it's, it's faith alone right here in the Bible. No, you're excommunicated. You can't just like add words in the Bible to make your pet theory work. So yeah, Luther is, he's a bad guy and he's a heretic. What's your response there, Dr. Parks? Well, I think there's a, a number of ways that we can look about it. I think first and foremost, if, if he really believes what he's saying here, he doesn't really understand how translations actually work. What we're trying to do when we translate something is to make it understandable to the receptor language. So in Luther's case, to those who were speaking not Greek or, or Latin, but instead who were speaking German. And we don't have to wonder why Luther added the word because he actually tells us about it. So for example, he he has a work that he did called On Translating. And in it, he explains his translation of Romans. Here's what he says. He says, here in Romans 3, I know very well that the word solum is not in Greek or in the Latin text. The papists didn't have to teach me that. 
In fact, that these four letters, S-O-L-A, that's the, the Latin for alone, are not there. And these blockheads stare at them like cows at a new gate. At the same time, they don't see that it conveys the sense of the text. It belongs there if the translation is to be clear and vigorous. I wanted to speak German, not Latin or Greek, since it was German I'd undertaken to speak in the translation. But it's the nature of our German language that in speaking of two things, one of which is affirmed and the other denied, we use the word allein, along with the word nicht, not, or kein, no. For example, we say the farmer brings allein grain and kein money. No, really, I have now nicht money, but allein grain. I have allein eaten and nicht yet drunk. Did you align write it and nicht read it over? So he concludes by saying there are innumerable cases of this kind in daily use. So the idea is basically this. Luther's saying, I'm trying to speak German here. This is how we Germans speak. Theologically, it's fairly straightforward. If you were to take a piece of paper, Todd, just a white piece of paper and divide it right down the middle with a thick black line. And on the right side of the paper, you write down the things that, let's say, for example, the Apostle Paul says, do justify. And on the left side of the paper, you write down all of the things that don't justify. Well, on the right side of the paper, you would find one thing and only one thing, and that is faith. In fact, faith apart from the works of the law. So if there's only one thing in the column that justifies, then it stands alone, which is tantamount to saying faith alone. So again, it's clear theologically, and this is why many of the church fathers actually use that word alone when they're expressing the meaning of Romans 3. Catholic scholars have have even admitted this. So Joseph Fitzmaier, for example, in his contribution on Romans to the Anchor Bible, points out that Origen and Hilary and Basil and Ambrosiaster and Chrysostom, Cyril of Alexandria and others have all also used the word. And Even critics in Luther's day, those who criticized Luther, said that there was nothing wrong with him adding that word there because he believes that it brought out the meaning of it. So, for example, one of his chief opponents in the Reformation was the Dutch humanist Desiderius Erasmus. But Erasmus actually writes in defense of Luther's edition there. And there are other editions of the Bible that come before Luther's that also have it. So, for example, and these are Catholic translations, the Italian translation of Genoa in 1476, the Nuremberg Bible of 1483, they both have the exclusive particle there as well. I think if I were to kind of wrap it up and to sum it up, I think I couldn't do better than the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. In Article 4, here's what Melanchthon says about it. He says, the particle alone offends some. Although even Paul says in Romans 3, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Again, Ephesians 2 8, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Again, Romans 3 24, being justified freely. And then he concludes, if the exclusive alone displeases them, let them remove from Paul also the exclusives freely not of works, it is the gift, etc. For these also are very strong exclusives. So I think there you have it in a nutshell. Here is Marshall talking about Luther being unnecessarily defiant or offensive. What if he had been the next Augustine or the next St. Francis or the next Thomas Aquinas? Well, we know that that didn't happen. What happened is, is he wrote the 95 Theses, which he posted publicly, they began to be distributed, and then he was challenged by the church to defend his doctrines, which were uh, critical of certain elements, primarily the jurisdiction of the Pope, the role of indulgences, and authority. And when he was challenged, he began to take on a more and more defiant tone. And if you ever read any of Martin Luther's work, you pick up on that immediately. It's very polemical, very hostile, and honestly at times offensive to the ears. The language he uses, the abuse that he throws on his opponents is pretty offensive. I mean, he was definitely not a politically correct man. And that comes out very clearly in his writings. What would you have to say? 
I think a few things about that. I, I, first and foremost, I, there's there's a bit of irony in it in that a lot of Taylor Marshall's critics say the very same things about him when he levies accusations against the reformers or against modern Protestants. But I think ultimately what we need to remember is that Luther, like all of us, was a man of his time, and he was a man of his place, and he was a man of his culture. And so he expresses himself as a man, not of the 21st century, not as an American, not as one in our sort of PC culture, but instead he expresses himself as a man of the 16th century, a German who expressed himself in the way that they did in the culture then. And so sometimes, certainly things that he say might come off a little bit harsh to 21st century American ears, but they wouldn't have necessarily come off that way to contemporaries of Luther. In fact, the things that Luther says about his opponents aren't any worse than the things that he says, for example, about himself. I'll give you just a quick example of that. When those who had embraced the Reformation were initially starting to be called Lutherans by the Roman Catholics. Luther essentially says, why would the children of God be called after my name, miserable sack of worms that I am? Well, if someone says that they're a miserable sack of worms in our day and age, we think, oh, that sounds really harsh. They sound self-loathing, but that was just the way that they kind of talked back then. Luther talked that way also about the Germans, right? His own people. He talks about them being beasts or, or drunkards and these kinds of things. This is how they spoke and how they communicated back then. And you even sort of get kind of snapshots that are similar to this with the apostles themselves, because they were men of their time. And when they expressed themselves, they weren't expressing themselves as 21st century politically correct people. So you think about the apostle Paul, for example, when he writes in Titus chapter one, when he speaks about the Cretans, he says, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Paul says, right? Or when he's writing against the uh, the Galatian Judaizers who were making so much about circumcision, Paul kind of in a tongue-in-cheek way says, I wish that those who unsettle you, the Galatians, this is in Galatians 5.12, would emasculate themselves. In other words, they're so proud of cutting off parts of their flesh, I wish they'd go the whole way and finish the job. And again, this might sound harsh to modern ears, but it wouldn't have in the ancient world. And it gets the point across quite clearly, which is we're talking about very important matters here. And when we discuss very important matters, it's uh, sometimes appropriate, I think, to use things like mockery or humor as a legitimate means of criticism. We might not do it in exactly the same way in our day and age, but we still do continue to do it. So does that mean that we are free to follow Luther's example in every respect? We'll answer that question with Dr. Stephen Parks as we respond to criticisms of Martin Luther, made by Roman Catholic apologist Dr. Taylor Marshall. Here's a gift recommendation for your pastor during Pastor Appreciation Month, the Concordia Commentary on Haggai and Malachi. This new commentary explores Haggai's exhortation to rebuild the temple and Malachi's concern with the practices in the temple. The Concordia Commentary on Haggai and Malachi is published by Concordia Publishing House. Their phone number, 1-800-325-3040, or learn more at issuesetc.org. The new Concordia Commentary on Haggai and Malachi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Our church loves and is grateful for those that serve our country. Operation Barnabas, part of Ministry to the Armed Forces, equips you to reach out to veterans in your community to bring Christ to those that served. Call Ministry to the Armed Forces at 314-996-1337 or email lcmschaps at lcms.org. Thank you for your service. Thank you. God bless our military. Concordia University Chicago invites all high school students to attend the annual Careers for Christ weekend in person on our beautiful campus in River Forest. Careers for Christ is October 12th through the 14th. You will have the opportunity to learn about professional church vocations while having fun with CUC staff, faculty, and students. For more information, visit cuchicago.edu forward slash c4c. cuchicago.edu forward slash c the number 4c. 
Did you know that how you arrange your sanctuary confesses something about what you believe? That where you put your baptismal font or your pulpit or your altar says something about your confession of Jesus Christ? And that as Lutherans, the key for us is always to put Christ first and foremost? To learn more about sanctuaries that confess Jesus Christ, pick up your October issue of The Lutheran Witness. Visit cph.org slash witness to subscribe or our website witness.lsms.org. The Lutheran Witness, helping you interpret the world from a Lutheran perspective. The Faith Once for All Delivered to the Saints. You're listening to Issues Etc. Thanks to the following congregations for standing with us by becoming an Issues Etc. congregational sponsor. Emmanuel Lutheran, Arcadia, Indiana. Prince of Peace Lutheran, Valparaiso, Indiana. Martin Luther Chapel, Marathon, Florida. All Saints Lutheran, Charlotte, North Carolina. Zion Lutheran, Winter Garden, Florida. St. Paul Lutheran, Eden Valley, Minnesota. Mount Olive Lutheran, Duluth, Minnesota. Bethany Lutheran, Naperville, Illinois. Emmanuel Lutheran, Lewiston, Minnesota. And Pilgrim Lutheran, Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. Find out how your confessional Lutheran church can support this worldwide outreach by including Issues Etc. in your mission or advertising budget. Just go to issuesetc.org, click Support Donate, and print a one-page flyer. When your congregation becomes an Issues Etc. sponsor, we'll publicize your church on the podcast at our website, and in the Issues Etc. Journal. Welcome back to Issues Etc. I'm Todd Wilkin. We're responding to criticisms of Martin Luther made by Roman Catholic apologist Dr. Taylor Marshall. Dr. Stephen Parks is our guest. So, before the break, Stephen, you were talking about Martin Luther's demeanor at times. He could be a jerk... But that doesn't mean that that gives us license to behave the way he did at times. No, not at all. Not, not any more than we could get into a time machine, go back to the 16th century and live in Germany. He was a man of his time and his place, and he was who he was. And we live in our time and in our place, and we are to be who we are. So I think what we ought to do is always seek to try to follow the, the commands that the apostles give us. You know, when Peter talks about how to engage others in the faith, he says, always be ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within you, but to do it with gentleness and with respect. So just because we sometimes observe the apostles being tongue in cheek, or sometimes just because we observe the reformers being harsh, well, I'm not an apostle and I'm not a reformer. I'm your average rank and file Christian, and I want to listen to what the apostles have to say. And so I'm going to do my best to not be a pushover, but by the same token, also not to be unnecessarily offensive, but to give reasons, as Peter says, with gentleness and with respect. Here is Marshall again. Should Luther have silently borne persecution? Now, there have been other saints in the history of the church who have been persecuted by the church. St. Teresa of Avila is a doctor of the church, a wonderful woman saint, and she at times was persecuted, John of the Cross as well. In our own time, in the past century, St. Pio, Padre Pio, was persecuted by the church. The church forbid him to say Mass publicly. Can you imagine that? This great saint with the stigmata could not say Mass publicly. He could not hear confessions. The church buttoned him down so that he could not fulfill, to the full extent, his priestly ministry. But the difference between St. Pio and, or Padre Pio and Father Luther, is that Padre Pio, in quietness and in prayer and in humility, submitted to the unjust persecution of his own Catholic Church against him. He offered that suffering for the salvation of souls and the betterment of the Church. And the Church was blessed for it. And he was blessed. He became a great saint. In the case of Martin Luther, he pushed back. Dr. Parks, what's your response? Well, again, I think there are a couple things we could say here, but I think the most important thing is, is the one that should take point, and that's this. Luther wasn't upset about the church simply persecuting him as an individual or saying bad things about him as an individual. If his opponents were simply saying Luther's an ugly man or something like that, or he smells bad, I think Luther just would have had a good laugh about it. If anything, his writings indicate that he had a good sense of humor, especially about himself. But 
Luther wasn't standing up for himself or for his own sake, but instead he was standing for the truth of the gospel. And when you stand for the truth of the gospel, you're not called to submit in quietness when it's being overthrown, when it's being compromised, or when it's being trodden underfoot. The Apostle Paul speaks about this in Galatians chapter 2, when he speaks about those Galatian Judaizers. And he says, to them, we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And that's the point, is is that the apostle here is standing up, not for his own sake, but he's standing up for the truth of the gospel for the sake of his neighbor. Why? Because genuine knowledge of the gospel leads to true salvation. A false gospel can only lead to a false salvation. So this was Luther's ultimate concern. And again, it's the kind of thing where if you actually read Luther, Taylor Marshall would find out that Luther was standing up not for his own sake, but for the sake of the gospel. So listen to this. This is in his commentary on Galatians, and he speaks about why he is doing what he's doing and taking the stand that he takes. Here's what he says. He says, just as our opponents refuse to concede to us the freedom that faith in Christ alone justify, so we refuse to concede to them in turn that faith formed by love justifies. Here we intend and are obliged to be rebellious and stubborn with them, for otherwise we would lose the truth of the gospel. We would lose that freedom which we have, not in the emperor or in kings and princes or in the pope or in the world or in the flesh, but in Christ Jesus. We would lose faith in Christ, which, as I have said, takes hold of nothing but Christ, the jewel. If our opponents will let us keep intact this faith by which we're born again, justified and incorporated into Christ, we're willing to do anything for them that's not contrary to this faith. But because we cannot obtain this concession from them, we, for our part, will not but be the least bit He goes on to say, for the issue before us is grave and vital. It involves the death of the Son of God, who by the will and commandment of the Father became flesh, was crucified, and died for the sins of the world. If faith yields on this point, the death of the Son of God will be in vain. Then it's only a fable that Christ is the Savior of the world. Then God is made a liar, for he's not lived up to his promises. Therefore, Our stubbornness on this issue is pious and holy, for by it we're striving to preserve the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to keep the truth of the gospel. If we lose this, Luther says, we lose God, Christ, all the promises, faith, righteousness, and eternal life. So because Luther's concerned precisely about others, because he doesn't want them to lose God, Christ, the promises, faith, righteousness, and eternal life. He must stand fast in the truth of the gospel, and therefore he did, as the Apostle Paul did, and therefore he was unwilling to submit even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for us. Here's Taylor Marshall. Was Luther responsible for the erosion of Christian civilization? And we see in Luther the attitude that we do not want to take. And it's that attitude that was spread by the Protestant Reformation, and it literally shattered Europe. And if you look at the time clock from 1517 to today, you begin to see the erosion of Western and Christian civilization. That is a pretty big accusation. Is there any truth to it? There's a huge accusation there, and, and the only truth that really is to it is he gets the, the time period right in the sense of saying that we can look at the time clock from 1517 to the, the current situation in order to find the shattering of the Christian world. However, he gets the cause wrong. See, what happens in the Reformation is that because the Reformers were gaining such tremendous ground in terms of pointing out the teaching of Holy Scripture and the teaching of the Church Fathers, the counter-reformers within Roman Catholicism had to find a way to try to answer their charges. And one of the ways that they did it was to try to find some kind of refuge in philosophical arguments. And as early as Luther's debates with Desiderius Erasmus, they began to try to find the philosophy of skepticism as being kind of a grounds by which to take a stand against the reformers. Now, for listeners who aren't familiar, the philosophy of skepticism essentially says, well, Todd, because you are a fallible human being, you can never be certain about anything that you believe is true, because you could, at least in theory, be wrong about it. 
And so skepticism kind of eats everything that it touches. What the Roman Catholics wanted to do was to take this philosophical skepticism and to only apply it inconsistently to the claims of Luther and the Protestants. Now, you don't have to take my word for this. People have done groundbreaking work on this. One of the foremost experts on the philosophy of skepticism is a philosophical historian by the name of Richard Popkin. And he wrote a series of books called The History of Skepticism. And there are two within that series, especially, that trace the Roman Catholic usage of skepticism and uh, it leading ultimately to what we refer to today as the Enlightenment and all of the trouble that comes right along with that. Uh, the two especially are The History of Skepticism from Erasmus to Spinoza, and then another volume, The History of Skepticism from Savonarola to Bale. And in there, he demonstrates beyond a shadow of a doubt that beginning with Erasmus, working through other philosophers like Moore, Pascal, Hobbes, Spinoza, and Leibniz, this Catholic use of skepticism enters into the mainstream, and it ultimately is what causes the unraveling of Christendom. So while the Reformation acts as a catalyst, it's not them, it's not the Reformers, it's not the Lutherans that caused the unraveling, but rather it was the Catholics trying to use whatever kind of philosophy that they found helpful without seeing what it would ultimately do to not just Protestantism, but Catholicism, to Christendom as a whole, and in fact, to society, to thinking, and to any form of critical thought whatsoever. Dr. Stephen Parks is our guest. We're responding to criticisms of Martin Luther made by Roman Catholic apologist Dr. Taylor Marshall. It does seem a little simplistic to blame one man for the downfall of Western civilization. We'll talk about that next. Why is reverence a hallmark of Lutheran worship? Find out in Pastor Will Whedon's column in the latest Issues Etc. journal. We'll send it to you free. Just click the red journal subscription image in the right-hand column at issuesetc.org. In the Wittenberg Trail feature, Pastor Joshua Shooping tells the story of his disillusionment with the errors of Eastern Orthodoxy and his joy in finding a gospel-centered confession of faith in confessional Lutheranism. The free online Issues Etc. journal issuesetc.org. Where is God's mission? God's mission is everywhere. Yes, it's far away, but it's also very near. It's as near as your congregation in school, your neighborhood, your family and friends, even as near as your home. Wherever you are, God's mission is in that place. Through his mission, Christ is bringing forgiveness, life and salvation to people everywhere, even here, right where you are. God's mission here. Learn more at lcms.org slash national mission. More topics, more guests, more Jesus. You're listening to Issues Etc. Why does Ed Crusom do what we do? Well, the good news of Christianity is too important not to share with our neighbors, and Lutheran theology too exquisite to not want to shout it from the rooftops. So when you want to put what you believe, teach, and confess on display, Ed Crusom is there for you, with gifts, ornaments, church banners, jewelry, icons, crucifixes, and much more. Visit adcrucem.com. That's A D C R U C E M.com. Confessional Lutherans are invited to rent a four bedroom, three bathroom Table Rock lakefront home in the Ozarks. Table Rock Lake is a premier lake in the heart of the Ozarks for boating, water sports, and fishing. This log cabin style rental sleeps 12 and is 30 minutes from Branson and 20 minutes from Silver Dollar City. Learn more by calling Swanson Estates. 713-855-2681. Be sure to mention Issues Etc. 713-855-2681. Welcome back to Issues Etc. I'm Todd Wilkin. We're responding to the criticisms of Roman Catholic apologist Dr. Taylor Marshall of Martin Luther. Dr. Stephen Parks is our guest. Senior Pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in Glendora, California. Formerly served as an Associate Professor of Theology and Philosophy at Concordia University, Irvine, California. God's richest blessings to Pastor Travis Henry, recently installed as an active duty Air Force chaplain. Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod chaplains deliver word and sacrament ministry to our military personnel and their families. Learn more about their service 
at lcms.org slash armed forces, lcms.org slash armed forces. Before the break, we were talking about Luther's effect on Western civilization, and Marshall's criticism here just seems very facile and simplistic to me, blaming one man for the downfall of Western civilization when any historian is going to say it's much more complicated than that. Much more than that. But the reality is that, especially with Taylor Marshall and with some, not all, but with some Roman Catholic apologists, Luther is kind of at the the heart of everything that's wrong, no matter what it is. So if an abortion law gets passed, they'll blame Luther, even though he was quite clear about what he thought about those things. If the LGBTQ movement gains ground, they're going to blame Luther. If a hurricane hits somewhere bad like we've been experiencing, they'll blame Luther for that too somehow. It's very facile, as you said. It's a very simplistic way of approaching history, and especially simplistic in terms of approaching the history of ideas. But the reality is that with Taylor Marshall, the idea ultimately comes down to, well, whatever makes his case and whatever helps Mother Church must, in the end, be defensible or justifiable in some way. So it's this idea, and you know, Todd, I don't often say this about people, but with him especially, the idea almost always, or the arguments almost always come down to, well, it works for me, so I'm going to go ahead and use it. Here is Taylor Marshall. Did Luther deny internal transformation? Now, there's also problems with Martin Luther's theology. He said that salvation is in primarily extrinsic, that is outside of you, outside of your soul, reality. So God declares you as righteous or just. He doesn't actually transform or make you just. Primarily, it is an imputed justification, right? He would call it alien righteousness. It's righteousness that comes from, not from you, but from another and it's imputed or deposited in your ledger, in your account as being righteous. And this is why Luther could say things like, if you're going to sin, sin boldly, because the grace of God covers you. The righteousness of Christ covers you. Did he rightly interpret Luther's view of righteousness and rightly understand Luther's one-off statement, really truly a casual statement in a letter sin boldly? Absolutely not. So you'll note that one of the things that he said in there is is that Luther didn't teach that God transforms us or makes us holy. And he's absolutely wrong about that. Now, he is right that in justification, that our internal transformation isn't the cause of the forgiveness of sins. The cause of the forgiveness of sins is what happens outside of us in Christ's life lived for us, in Christ's death died for us, and in Christ's resurrection accomplished for us on our behalf. But that does not mean that Luther taught that that was the end of the story and there's nothing else that goes on. In fact, Luther was a very vocal critic of that kind of idea. There were some in Luther's day that taught that kind of thing, the antinomians, for example, and Luther wrote against them. So listen to this from Luther. Here's what he says when he's speaking about this internal transformation. He says, for there is no such Christ that died for sinners who do not, after the forgiveness of sins, desist from sins and lead a new life. And then speaking of those who say this kind of things, he says, they may be fine Easter preachers, but they're very poor Pentecost preachers, for they do not preach about the sanctification by the Holy Spirit, but solely about the redemption of Jesus Christ, although Christ, whom they extol so highly and rightfully so, is Christ, that is, he has purchased redemption from sin and death so that the Holy Spirit might transform us out of the old Adam into new men. We die unto sin and live unto righteousness, beginning and growing here on earth and perfecting it beyond, as St. Paul teaches. Christ did not only earn gratia, that is grace for us, but also donum, the gift of the Holy Spirit, so that we might have not only forgiveness of, but also cessation of sin. Now, he who does not abstain from sin, but persists in his evil life, must have a different Christ, that of the antinomians. The real Christ is not there, even if all angels would cry, Christ, Christ, he must be damned with his new Christ. 
So Luther is arguing here that there's only one real Jesus, and the real Jesus won for us not only the gift of the forgiveness of sins, but also the gift of the Holy Spirit, who sanctifies us, who transforms us, and who causes us to fight and to fight daily against sin. In terms of the statement, sin boldly, Catholics love to cite this. They couldn't tell you where it comes from to save their lives, nor have they probably ever read it within the the context. Luther's actually writing a letter to Melanchthon, and Melanchthon had a bit of a timid conscience, and he was very concerned about whether or not he was really and truly a Christian, whether or not he really truly was forgiven of his sins. And as he writes about being troubled by his sins, Luther writes back to him and says, look, it's good that you have real sins because Christ only died for real sinners. He didn't die for painted sinners, in other words, fake sinners. If you were just a fake sinner and you weren't a real sinner, Luther is essentially saying, then you wouldn't be one for whom Christ died. So let your sins be strong, let your sins be bold. That would be the literal translation of saying it, because you have a bolder and a stronger Christ. So the whole point of that was to comfort Melanchthon with the forgiveness of sins, because yes, Melanchthon is really and truly feeling his sins, but it's only for those who truly have sins that Christ died. And so the whole point of all of that is to bring the comfort of the gospel, not in order to tell people to go out and sin it up. Finally, here is Taylor Marshall on Luther's doctrine of justification lacking beauty and sanctity. The way he understands salvation is extremely crude and vulgar and obscene, and it does not have the character of beauty and sanctity that we find in the writings of the true Catholic saints. I'm thinking here, for example, Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, Augustine, the Little Flower, St. Therese de Lisieux, St. Teresa of Avila, who already mentioned, John of the Cross, St. Bernard of Clairvaux. These saints, when you read their writings, you are caught up in grace. You can feel the Holy Spirit lifting you up. And we don't see that in Luther, at least, and I've never felt that. Even when I was a Protestant and I was reading Luther, I was always a little bit embarrassed that this was our this was our main head cheerleader, Martin Luther. What are your thoughts? Well, based on his criticisms of Luther, I'm not sure how frequently, if ever, he's actually really and truly read Luther, at least deeply. What he actually presents here, though, is a really subjective kind of an idea, right, that Luther's doctrine of justification lacks beauty and sanctity because Taylor Marshall didn't feel it when he read it. But there are a lot of people, myself included, who actually do feel it and who do kind of get caught up in the love and the grace of God when we read it. And I'm not alone. I mean, even people outside of the Lutheran tradition have commented on it. So it's actually hearing the work of Luther being read where he's expounding the gospel, where Wesley receives the assurance of salvation and talks about his heart being strangely warmed. When John Bunyan, a Baptist, right, reads Luther, he talks about how it's Luther's works second only to the Bible, which are most fit for a wounded conscience. I mean, all you have to do is just read even the stuff that Luther didn't intend for theologians, but for the laity. So listen to his his large catechism, for example, when he's explaining the second article of the creed, redemption. He says, for when we have been created by God the Father and had received from him all manner of good, The devil came and led us into disobedience, sin, death, and all evil, so that we fell under his wrath and displeasure and were doomed to eternal damnation as we had merited and deserved. There was no counsel, help, or comfort until this only and eternal Son of God, in his unfathomable goodness, had compassion upon our misery and wretchedness and came from heaven to help us. Those tyrants and jailers then are all expelled now, and in their place has come Jesus Christ, Lord of life, righteousness, every blessing and salvation, and has delivered us poor lost men from the jaws of hell, has won us, made us free, and brought us again into the favor and grace of the Father, and has taken us as his own property under his shelter and protection, that he may govern us by his righteousness, wisdom, power, life, and blessedness." That catches me up in the grace 
and in the love of God. I mean, you have God's goodness in creation extolled. You have Satan's wickedness and deceiving humanity condemned. You have Christ's virtue and goodness and humility and his compassion that are being magnified. You have the sufficiency of Christ's work of redemption being praised. You have the comfort of the gospel being applied and lauded. You have the blessedness of everlasting life acclaimed. What more could you hope for? And this isn't necessarily because of Luther's brilliance or because of his eloquence, but it's because he's teaching what Holy Scripture teaches. And there's nothing more beautiful and there's nothing more sanctifying than the truth of God revealed to us in Scripture. That and that alone is what Luther declares to us. Why are some Catholic apologists kind of have Luther derangement syndrome? (laughs) That's a good way to put it. Well, I think the reality is that, number one, they don't often read Luther. And you can kind of tell this to a certain degree when they quote Luther and their little snippets and, and so forth. They almost always quote him from the Weimar edition of Luther's works. And when I see that, I always ask them if they know how to read ecclesiastical Latin or high medieval German because the Weimar edition is an untranslated edition of Luther's works. And the reason why you always find them citing from the Weimar edition of Luther's works isn't because they're scholarly and they're seeking to do scholarly work, but it's because they're picking that stuff up from quote books. So they've seen it cited elsewhere and it's made the rounds on Twitter and other places and they're just repeating it without ever having actually examined things within their context. I I find these things all the time where Luther is constantly being accused of saying things or teaching things that he didn't or his, his words are being ripped out of their native context in order to make it look like he's saying things that favor the Catholic argument. And that's the reality. Not all Catholic apologists fall into this category, but there are all too many who are willing to say or do anything as long as it scores points for the Catholic Church. But that can't be our attitude. We can't simply start by saying, well, I know that I'm true, so anything and everything I say that furthers my cause has to be the right way of going about doing things. Holy Scripture forbids us from lying, and we're not allowed to lie about people that we don't like, and we're not allowed to sin in order that grace may abound. We're not allowed to lie in order that truth may abound. We have to tell the truth, but it's much more difficult to dismantle a position that is carefully constructed from Holy Scripture. It's much easier to just straw man something, knock it down, make it look like a victory, and sort of kind of give a raw, raw speech to those who are already inclined to believe Luther was a bad guy, instead of actually reading him for ourselves, putting him in the context and seeing what he actually said. Do many Roman Catholics believe the myth that Lutherans confess and believe all the writings and teachings of Martin Luther? I think they do, even though many apologists would recognize that there are only some things, of course, that Luther wrote that that make it into our confessions. But they want to kind of go about the business of really coming up with sort of gotcha quotes from Luther. So if he ever said something in an unguarded moment, let's say in his table talk or something like that, then they'll grab that, rip it out of context, almost canonize it and say that you're obliged to believe this if you're a Lutheran or a Protestant, or this is always going to be where Lutheranism or Protestantism is going to lead you. But the reality is kind of, as you indicated, Todd, there are only a a certain set of writings, and they're extremely small in comparison to all of the things that Luther wrote, that a Lutheran is obliged to subscribe to. In the Lutheran Confessions, for example, you have things like the large and the small catechism, and you've got the small called articles. And that's it. When Luther was reflecting on his own writings, he said he he wouldn't mind if all of them kind of faded into obscurity with the exception of his catechisms and the bondage of the will. So even Luther himself wasn't asking us to hold to all of the things that he ever said or wrote. I think the fact that he indicates that his catechisms are among the best things that he wrote are instructive. Why? Because it's there that he points us first and foremost to the Holy Scriptures and urges us back to them constantly and urges also their memorization. And that's the point of Luther. When he points us back to our Lord Jesus Christ and back to the Word of God, which he did, we're grateful for him. In those unguarded moments where he might point us away from our Lord Jesus Christ, away from the Word of God, then we have to depart from Luther. It's as simple as that. 
Dr. Stephen Parks is Senior Pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in Glendora, California, formerly served as Associate Professor of Theology and Philosophy at Concordia University, Irvine, California. Dr. Parks, thank you. Thank you so much, Todd. It's always great being with you. Thursday on Issues Etc., we'll have Pastor Brian Wolf Miller respond to the myth Luther didn't go far enough in reforming the church. We'll discuss how a Christian community confesses Christ in a culture of isolation. Our guest will be Dr. Joel Bierman and its media coverage of religion with journalist Terry Mattingly. I'm Todd Wilkin. Thanks for listening. Listen weekday afternoons to Pastor Todd Wilkin and guests on Issues Etc. Issues Etc. is a listener-supported program. Your financial support is vital for the continuation and expansion of this worldwide outreach. Our mailing address, Issues Etc., P.O. Box 83, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. Box 83, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. You can also donate at our website, issuesetc.org. Issues Etc., is a production of LPR, Lutheran Public Radio.